Uh, we like to talk about wine appreciation too is a full sensory experience. So with Tempranillo in particular, um, we're gonna look at the wine, we're gonna smell the wine, we're gonna talk about the texture of the wine, in addition to the most obvious, which is what the wine tastes like. So Tempranillo itself is a darker fruit. And you're gonna notice that when Andrea and Nate start talking about their trip to Ribera del Duero, which is one of the most popular Tempranillo regions, uh, growing regions in Spain. Um, there's a lot of darker fruit uh, that comes out of that particular Tempranillo. Um, purple fruits, black fruits, uh, things that we don't always see, uh, but it can be really balanced and have a lot of different uh, fruit characteristics to it. So it's a wonderful complex grape with a lot of different things you can do from different wine regions. Um, so I'm so glad everybody's, I see even like a table down here. Are you guys having dinner? Oh my goodness. Cheese. Oh, sorry. I just noticed the cheese plate down on the bottom corner. The baby. <laughs> I know. Yes. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I mean, very versatile. Go ahead, Jess. Interject really quick. Hi. I mean, I think everyone knows I'm Jess. Um, but I will be monitoring. There is a chat option for, um, to ask questions and things like that. Um, I try like if someone's, if, you know, if someone's talking about something and kind of has a flow with that, and I try not to interrupt, but like wait for a time, but I am keeping an eye on that. Or if you feel like, you know, you'd rather just ask the question, just kind of get my attention. Um, I have everyone muted, except for Sheila and um, Nate and Dre right now. And, well, and myself. And so, um, but if you, you know, have any questions or anything like that, you just, uh, you can unmute yourself, or if you're having any issues, I can unmute you as well. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything, we want this to be interactive, and so um, questions will come up. And so feel free to add them in the chat or raise your hand. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it back to Sheila. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, Tempranillo is a fantastic, versatile grape like we were talking about. Uh, originated in Spain in the 13th century. They're not exactly sure how far back it goes because of all the different names that it goes by. So we know it as Tempranillo in the modern era, but in Portugal and in the Iberian Peninsula, sometimes they'll call it Tinto Roriz. Um, in Madrid, uh, they've got a different name for it, uh, Cis. Ciciano, uh, but just depending where you go, they may call it something else, um, but it does go that far, that far back. And then at some point in the 19th century, they start picking up a lot of the French winemaking techniques, starting to use oak barrels um, and really embracing wine culture and bringing what these particular grapes, um, uh, a little more shine to it. Uh, the Spanish conquistadors brought it to North America, uh, mostly Central America, and actually some of the oldest uh, vines in North America are in Mexico, and some of those grapes are Tempranillo. So it's, a lot of people don't think of Mexico as being a very prominent winemaking region, but Mexico has some of the oldest vines in North America. And then it comes to California sometime during the gold rush. Uh, they start bringing vines and clippings into California via that, usually by seed or small vines. Uh, it took them a while to figure out where to plant Tempranillo in California. It did not immediately um, embrace our climate, um, even though it loves hot weather, it likes cool evenings, but it likes a really kind of particular type of soil, more clay and limestone. And so planting Tempranillo in California was a bit of a challenge at first, but they eventually figured it out. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful little pocket vineyards if you find all around San Francisco um, where you've got some old, old, old vineyards where the grapes age all the way back to that 1800 area, area where people were just all floods of people from all over the world were coming into the San Francisco Bay and just seeing what, what might work. So Tempranillo was one of those grapes that that's how it's found, uh, found its way to us. Um, and then in Portugal, like I said, they'll call it Tinto Roriz. And with some other lighter skinned grapes um, is the base for a lot of port wines. So if you drink port from Portugal, most likely you have had Tempranillo in that, um, in that respect. And that's a fortified version of Tempranillo where they add a little bit of alcohol to it. Um, and, but a lot of the base of that is going to be uh, that particular 
fruit. And uh, one of the things they learned really quickly about tempranillo, temprano in Spanish, if anyone is a Spanish speaker, uh, means early. It's a short harvest season. It's a lot shorter than most of your grapes. So it ripens really quickly um, and it has a very thick skin. So a lot of people will compare tempranillo to cabernet because it has that type of complexity. Um, it can thrive in warm clients. It can uh, age really well. And then it can add all different types of layers based on that culture. So um, in a lot of respects, Tempranillo is the Cabernet of Spain. They like to blend it with some of the other grapes. They like to age it at different um, capacities, um, but it does have a lot of uh, similarities to Cabernet in that respect. So if you're a Cabernet drinker, a lot of times Tempranillo, um, you might think of as like a summertime cab. It's a little bit lighter, not quite as tannic as Cabernet, um, but it still has a little of the complexity that you can get from an aged grape. And again, highly, highly ageable. So they figured that out in Spain after they start embracing some of the French wine techniques, that Tempranillo only gets better with age. And that's really remarkable for them to figure out because up until then, the only people who had been able to age wines were the French. So Tempranillo becomes a hallmark for Spain and wine production goes way up primarily in Rioja. So if you go to the store and you ask for Tempranillo, a lot of times you will not see Tempranillo on the label, but what you will see is Rioja. Rioja splashed all over that bottle, um, real large letters, and there's different types of Rioja. So when you see a Rioja, basically what you're drinking, let's pause and say hi to Nate really quick. <laughs> Nate's there. <laughs> Good to see you all. We're excited about Tempranillo and hear about your trip. Um, you so, oh, so Rioja uh, becomes the winemaking region of Spain. Uh, when you go to the store and you're looking for a Tempranillo, like I said, a lot of times it won't say that on the label. It will say Rioja, and it's usually the majority of Tempranillo, but it has a little bit of Garnacha and Graciano. So just like Cab, it's usually got some percentages of other grapes to help make it a, fu a fully balanced wine. Um, and then they'll age it in different respects. Um, a Hoven, when you see those, really is like no age at all. But then they start experimenting with the oak, just like the French are doing. So things like a Rioja Reserva is usually a two-year-old wine. A Grand Reserva is like five-year-old wine. Uh, Crianza, I, no, Crianza is two, Reserve is three, um, Grand Reserve is a five-year-old wine. So whenever you're seeing those Riojas, those have a lot of the same complexities as your aged Cabernets um, because it's going to have a lot of that spice characteristic. Another thing the Spanish start doing um, in the mid-1970s um, is they start switching from French oak to American oak. So that adds to some of the similarities to Cabernet because every time we're using American oak, you're adding things like vanilla and cedar and spice box to those spice characteristics. So that is a real blend of like French winemaking techniques, but a lot of things that we do here in North America in our domestic wine production. Uh, I was going to pass it over to Nate and Dre so they can start talking about their trip at Ribera del Duero. That's the other largest winemaking region in Spain where most of the Tempranillo is grown um, um, in Spain. All right, um, we're super excited to talk about our trip to Spain. We have Patty and Bernie um, with us tonight and they actually went to Spain with us. So that's very exciting to have a couple of the people that went on our trip with us here. Um, when we were deciding where we wanted to take our inaugural trip to Europe, uh, we thought about all the different regions that we wanted to go to. Um, I had been to France already, and then we just decided that uh, Nate already knew quite a bit about French winemaking. And so it was a toss up between Italy and Spain. And then we ended up going with Spain. And when we were planning the trip, the Tempranillo that we had experienced here in this area was much lighter, much more acidic than uh, the Tempranillo that we experienced in Spain. And so we packed two cases of Vinamota wine to take with us on a wine tasting trip in Spain. 
Um, Bernie and Patty carried a case for us. We carried a case because we figured after all day of drinking light, more acidic wine, uh, we were going to need something with some heft. And we were very, very wonderfully surprised when we got to Spain and discovered that Tempranillo there has so much depth of character. And so I'd like to give it over to Nate, who was, I mean, we were both very, very inspired, but Nate was very specifically inspired by Tempranillo while we were there in the trip. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Great to see everybody tonight. Um, hope everybody's doing well. But uh, so Tempranillo to me, uh, before I left um, for Spain, I was never really a huge fan of it. And I'd never found one that really struck me. And when we went to Spain, um, like Dre was saying, we thought it was going to be um, a lot of really light, uh, kind of watered down or too acidic, picked at 22, 23, really French style of winemaking, but it was not at all. It was just massive. And every place we went to, it was just huge. And so we did bring some light wines with us from Vinamoto as well, not just the big wines. Um, and we found ourselves drinking primarily only our light wines afterwards, just happened to like calm down after such big Tempranillo. So um, it was uh, it was a great experience, and one of the best experiences I had was getting to actually talk to all the winemakers. They're very similar to we are like we are in Murphy's. Uh, it's not the Napa crazy huge prestige places. It was uh, very down to earth people. A lot we talked to the owners in almost every place we went to, and uh, so it was great for me to get a go back, and the the rest of the group would be going with the the official tour person, but I'd sneak off with the winemaker owner of one of the places and I got to see all their barrel rooms, all the wood that they're putting with all our favorite wines. So it was great to get to actually taste the wine, then walk into their barrel room and see what they were doing to put that together. So when I came back, I just, I had a absolute knowledge of how Spanish winemakers are making the best Tempranillo in the world. And um, it was awesome had such a good time, such great experiences, best food I've ever eaten in my life. Like every <laughs> single, every <laughs> single meal is just crazy. But Tempranillo, we, we did all the regions leading up to our very last region that we did was the Toro. And so we'd really become adapted to the culture, the wines, everything. And once we went into Toro, it changed. Everything changed at that point. Um, we've never been greeted so graciously. Um, the meal they prepared for us was just, it was probably the best meal I've ever had in my life. And, it really was. Um, absolutely amazing. And then they started pouring us the $100 a bottle wines just as pours, like several different levels. And then they're pulling out at the very end the $1,000 bottle of wine that I'm, it's just absolutely mind blowing how good the quality of this was. And the hospitality and camaraderie. So when I came back, I instantly, it, I mean, it, it was no more than two weeks, maybe three weeks after we got back from Spain and Steve Collum, who was our greatest, who's passed away, rest in peace, but he was the greatest uh, mm -hmm. lover, a vineyard manager up here for sure. And then lover of Spanish wines and Tempranillo especially and uh, Sangiovese as well. Um, was another of his absolute favorites, but um, yeah, when we, when we got back, Steve said, "Okay, Nate, tell me which region." And uh, we'd we'd all been drinking a bit and partaking, and so it was a little bit more excited than normal conversations. And I said, "Hey, hands down, we walked in and it was Toro." And he's like, "Oh my God, I knew it! I knew it! I knew it!" And so yeah, he's like, "I'm kicking a guy off a of vineyard right now. I'm going to make sure that you get those grapes, Toro Tempranillo." So, I mean, it was just crazy that we just got off the plane and all of a sudden now I'm making Toro Tempranillo. So this was the very first experience of the Tempranillo that y'all are trying tonight is our 18 and just really liking how it's, for me, I'm loving how it's maturing into itself. And it's got that little bit of uh, animalistic quality to it, as well as the deep, rich fruit, layers of leather. So, yeah, I can't wait to see the way it ages out in another few years. One of the other things that we, well, we love the culture in Spain in general. Um, one of the things that our tour guide kept saying is this place will receive us at this time and these people 
will receive us at that time. And I thought it was a, um, just kind of a translation thing. And he explained to me, it's not a translation thing. They really do mean receive people because in their culture, they receive guests as though they're gifts. And that was just something that we really loved about the culture as, as everyone did really receive us as though we were gifts. I think Patty and Bernie would agree. Um, it was just wonderful everywhere we went and they always had a full spread of food for us to experience with the wine, the Iberian ham we had every day for sure. Um, I brought home a few of the bottles of uh, Tempranillo that we brought home from Spain. Um, this is called Almira's and this is a Toro from 2015. Uh, whoop, like that. It's kind of backwards since it's on my screen, but um, this was one of the Toros that we really loved. Um, this one is a 2014 Toro that we enjoyed. And then this is the one that Nate was talking about that was one of the more expensive bottles. And it was from the place that we just knew at that point that we had to work with Toro and it's called Alabaster. We won't be opening this one tonight. We're saving this one for when we gather again, when we're able to gather with our people that traveled to Spain with us. And then this one, we really, this isn't Toro. This is a regular Tempranillo, not the Toro clone. This is, uh, from one of the vineyards that uh, this is the grandfather's hands and this was a celebration of 50 years since he had started making wine and he taught his son to make wine and now his grandson is learning how to make wine and that was one of the wonderful things that we got to experience while we were there is the Ribeiro del Duero region is actually a fairly young region in Europe um, I think that they got designated as a DO in, nine, in the 1980s, am I right, Sheila? 1980s, and so that's fairly young for Europe, but they're very, very proud, and they've been making wine there for you know two to three hundred years. Some of the families, and so it was really amazing to get to go to these places and meet people whose family had been making wine from the grapes that were grown there for hundreds of years, and there was so much history there, and it was passed down generation to generation. Some of the places had caves that were uh, dug down into the ground or into the hillside that we got to go in and experience, and they had some uh, concrete uh, fermentation bins uh, in addition to their wood, but that's when Sheila was saying that they started introducing the French way of aging their wine with barrels. Prior to that, they did cement and concrete and uh, earthen ways of aging their wine. So then they started introducing the, the wood and it was really neat. Some of the places had these big, huge eggs rather than like a 59 gallon barrel or these huge eggs. Do you remember how many gallons there? Like 600 gallons. Like 600 gallons. And they were primarily made by Nadalier, which is the uh, cooper that we use for our French barrels. And so Nate was able to walk through those barrel rooms and see exactly which types of barrels they were using, both American and French. And so when we came back and we made our 2018, he knew exactly what we needed to do for our uh, our first Tempranillo. And so uh, we used one used Terenceau, which is a French from Nadalier, and then new Nadalier as well, American, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And that was the inspiration that he saw from those barrel, or not the barrel, yeah, the barrel rooms, um, barrel rooms, so that he could kind of try to replicate what they did. And so um, it was really nice being able to work with a varietal that we'd never worked with before, but have the confidence of knowing that we don't have to spend a year or two experimenting because we had already seen what these places had been doing and they had been making this varietal for hundreds of years and getting through their processes and, and really narrowing it down. So we were able to come back with a lot of confidence being able to work with that. Yeah, it was kind of funny on the barrel program when I would talk to the winemakers there, they said that the, uh, the American oak is extremely expensive. And so here in, in the United States, when we have to buy French oak because it comes all the way over, um, the ocean and whatever tariffs and blah blah but we're paying about twelve hundred dollars for a brand new french oak barrel when we buy a new american we're paying about four hundred four twenty for an american barrel so it's it was funny to see them talking about how expensive and seeing them be so uh, gentle and babying of these american oak barrels when american oak test is so cheap i'm just like oh those are american oak oh, it's not that big of a deal but so that was one thing that i i saw that was different that was pretty cool. Um, 
So for our 2018 that hopefully if anyone was able to have some tonight, uh, we only made 68 cases of that. And uh, because we weren't sure if we wanted to continue working with it. And then plus because usually the grape contracts are done in the spring and then we went to the Toro region in May and June. And so by the time we came back and Steve said he would make sure that he had held some back for us, we only got one ton of it that first year. We ordered one ton of it and it ended up being 1.17 tons crushed. And then the average bricks of everything that we brought in was 27.4. So as Nate said, when we went to Spain, we thought we were going to be having Tempranillo that was picked at 22, 23 bricks, which is very typical of the, the French winemaking style. So Nate likes to get that maximum extraction in color. So uh, 27.4 bricks was the average between our different fermentation bin, bins. And then of that year, the Tempranillo was only 4% of our production, which was a total of 32.68 tons. And then um, I don't know if anyone has been following along with each of the classes, I tell you how many gallons per ton that we get because the different uh, grape set has higher juice to skin ratio or lower juice to skin ratio. So on that first year, we were able to get 154 gallons per ton, which is really good. And then uh, as far as ripening, that was our 15th uh, pick out of 17 picks. So it was pretty late in the year. And so we picked on October 25th of 2018 and interestingly in 2019 which we are getting ready to bottle we also picked on october 25th but it was the 11th pick out of 16 picks and so a lot of our fruit ripened a little bit uh, later that year and so in 2019 we knew that we wanted to continue working with tempranillo and so we were able to get 2.37 tons and the average bricks were 26.4 so that's a full uh, bricks percentage lower than what we did the previous year. And that just had to do with the growing season of 2019. We had a later bud break and then we had a cooler spring and then a very, very hot summer that was 10 days long, over a hundred degrees. The sugar all spiked, but the fruit wasn't ripe yet. And so in 2019, we really struggled to make sure that we were picking things off the vine just right. Um, so that's one of the reasons it was 11th instead of 15th. Um, and then it was 8% of our total production and we got 135 gallons per ton, which is a lot less than the first year. And that probably has a lot to do with that growing um, time period. But then also that doesn't take into account the mug that we pull out. So I'm sure all of you are aware of our um, hand sorting practices. So the mog is anything that we pull out that we don't keep. And so sometimes if we see a lower uh, amount of gallons per ton, it's because we had to pull a lot of mog out. And so that year we probably had to pull a lot of red fruit. We had to pull anything that was too acidic, anything that was underripe. And with the um, clusters of the Tempranillo, they're fairly large clusters, but the skin is not as thick as a Syrah and the clusters are fairly tight, like Sheila was talking about. They're not super resistant to bugs and things like that because the, the clusters are fairly tight. And so we have to really go through all of the clusters and make sure that they are perfect. And so on a year where it's not ripening quite as evenly or there's a lot of underripe fruit or uh, fruit that is deficient, we have to pull all of that out. And so in 2019 and 2020, we've had to do that with a lot of our varietals just across the board and Tempranillo was no exception to that. Um, in 2020, which is the harvest that we just finished, uh, we got 1.56 tons and we went with a different vineyard. Um, the original vineyard that we had gone with in 2018 and 2019 ended up not having enough fruit for us. Uh, it was very, um, they had cropped it down to like one ton an acre. And so we were able to get fruit from Dalton Vineyard, which is where we get our Syrah and some of our Grenache. And um, so we were able to do 1.56 tons, average mix was 25, so even lower. And again, with the same issue of the, just the ripening season. And it was 7% of our total tons and we got 125 gallons. And it was the ninth of 12 picks. And so we didn't harvest quite as much this year. Um, it was on October 14th. So right around the same time each year that we've, we've picked. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry, sometimes Nate has little things to let me know I'm talking too much, and I wasn't sure if he was letting me know I'm talking too much. I was going to show them a visual, a really oh, yeah. bad Zoom like, sorry, this graphic's not great visual about what Nate and Dre are trying to accomplish there um, with their Tempranillo and draw it to Spain. So here's a very tiny pale map of Spain. And I just wanted to point out, here's where Robert del Duero is in Rioja. This is all Northern Spain up here. And then what you'll see even smaller, and I don't expect you to squint, but you can if you want, those are all mountains. So that's something that you guys have going for you in making Tempranillo in California is Tempranillo likes that higher elevation and it likes that high heat. So it's such a fascinating um, endeavor to try and recreate those wines because really that's what that region is very similar to and what you guys have in California is that northern Spain climate that's got those hills, it's got those mountains, it's got the higher elevation, it's got the heat, it's got the cool nights. And that's not easy to replicate because that those conditions don't exist everywhere in the world. That is not me crying. That is my dog, just to let you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's really fascinating because you have to have a lot of those conditions in order to grow that Tempranillo. And then, yeah, you'll lose a lot because it isn't naturally pest resi um, resistant as, as some grapes are because they're nice and juicy and yeah they're tight and close together and then i have numbers for in california tempranillo is definitely not one of the more widely grown grapes um, in 2018 um, there were only 12,848 tons crushed in california and that was 0.29 percent of the overall grapes crushed which is really really a small number and then in 2019 it was even less at just under 11,000 and 0.26 percent of all grapes, grapes crushed in California. So it's really exciting for us to get to work with a varietal that not only that we're so passionate about and that we love, but is so uncommonly found. And as Sheila said, the whole thing of it being in the mountains is one of the reasons that you don't find it a lot in California is it doesn't really grow all that well in the valley. It doesn't really grow all that well where it doesn't get cool in the evenings. You don't find it in a lot of regions. So it's really wonderful to get to work with it here in the foothills. And the vineyard that we've been working with, Matate, they are from Spain and they love the Toro clone. And so they actually flew to Spain and had um, the clippings from an actual vineyard in the Toro region brought them over and planted them. So they're not just from UC Davis or, or from somewhere else that, that uh, cloned them. They are from actual Spain, from the Toro region in the Rivera del Duero. So that's pretty exciting to work with. So we have a question. Um, okay. So it was mentioned that Tempran Tempranillo means early because it's usually one of the uh, varietals harvested earlier that sounds more like in Spain whereas here like October I mean I guess October is not early for us for harvesting so why would you like what would you guess would be the difference um, definitely just the growing region um, and then the times of year. So one of the things that we noticed about the vineyards in Spain in the, in the Ribeiro del Duero region is every vineyard had these big giant wind mills and they were specifically for pushing off frost. And uh, we don't, well, we get some frost, but we don't typically have frost later than what frog jump. So the third week of May is when we know that the frost will stop. And so we don't typically get bud break until the end of March. And then the buds don't have that much of uh, that much trouble with frost here. But in that region, they have a lot of trouble with frost and especially being at, an, at a higher elevation that's probably cooler than ours, um, then they do have that shorter growing season. And so depending on what else they're growing, um, which their, uh, their white is Verdejo, Verdejo, and uh, only a few others. Sheila will probably know the other reds that they grow there. We didn't experience a whole lot of different reds while we were there. Um, but for them, that is fairly early ripening and they're only growing a handful of varietals where we are harvesting, you know, up to 17 different varietals at any given, uh, on any given harvest. And so like Primitivo is 
called Primitivo because it's Prima and it's one of the earlier ripening ones. That's very true for us. It's always our first red. Whereas Zinfandel, which is a descendant of Primitivo, you would think would be the same, but grown here in California, it's our last red that we pick. And we don't really work with Zinfandel all that much anymore. So pre our Petite Syrah is usually our last one, or to not. Um, but it's just our, our region and the, the heat and cool cycles. And Does then, the question? Okay. yes, I think so. Okay. And then uh, Bernie and Patty are wondering, are asking Nate, didn't he, you bring home a clone? No, never did. No. We have to go through so much to bring home any kind of agricultural stuff. And so it would have been interesting to do. Um, one of the interesting things too about being able to walk through the vineyards there, um, the way they grow their vineyards is different than the way that we grow our vineyards here. And I think that I would love for Nate to talk more about the specifics of that because I could talk about what I saw, but it's not going to be uh, as educated as Nate. So a lot of them are the gnarly heads. Mm -hmm the gnarly heads and so it's like one vine that grows up and then it has all these parts coming out of it the canes coming out of it whereas here we have trellis system there they're not allowed to uh, irrigate or do anything like that whereas we do have irrigation most of the vineyards there are um, organic the biologique uh, which is very common in all of Europe and then ours were able to do pestilence sprays and things like that we try to shy away from that stuff um, but do you want to talk a little bit about the difference in the vineyards? Sure. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, more of a high mountain desert area where we were. A lot of uh, rocks and white sand, and uh, so yeah, they grew up and they were very low as well. So they only came up about a foot tall before they branch out and do what they were doing. Um, they felt like you get more energy um, extraction the lower your fruit set is to the ground because from the roots, all nutrients come to the vine. So they felt like the closer the fruit was to the vine, to the root, um, the more energy they get out, which is, is totally true. The higher and taller your vine is, the more you lose energy by the time it actually gets up there. But in our area where we live, um, we have so many deer, um, raccoons, squirrels, or like turkeys. everything that turkeys, yeah, um, that kill and, and disintegrate our vineyard so we've got to get our fruit up higher to keep it away from all the small animals and stuff out there there were no big deer fences nothing so I it was kind of crazy I'm like god you shoot all your deer or something in the whole country and they have no rodent no any problem so um, and then bird netting I never saw bird netting on anything so it was just it was definitely different than where we are where we've got every predator to a grape that you could imagine and then they had a really cool way to eradicate pests on the vineyards. And so what they did, because they can't spray or anything and they didn't want to because everything's organically done, is they had these little um, bug hotels. And so they would have an entomologist come out and figure out what kinds of bugs were infecting their vines. And then they would bring the predator to that bug in there. But instead of introducing a lot of it, they would just make it they would just do these little hotels that would make it a very hospitable environment for the bug that would eat those other bugs. And so it was really neat to see that because each vineyard, depending on where it was, had slightly different bug problems. But then instead of spraying them or doing anything like that, they just tried to encourage the bug that would eat those bugs to live in that area. And so the little bug hotels were really neat to experience, actually. And it's uh, the way that they encourage here in our vineyards, we have owl boxes and things like that to try and eat the rodents. Um, but they take it up a notch and just really create a, a wonderful environment for, for bugs to be able to take care of their, their vines. Yeah, and then another thing that was really uh, like different about the place that, that we were at was that it's a high mountain desert, like they were saying, um, but it, it got extremely hot in the summertime, and then it would get down and get cold and get uh, rainy and stuff in the wintertime. But it's so extreme in the summertime that most all the places we went to were underground. So they would dig down 30, 30 to 50 feet in some places, and all your cellaring was down there. Different rooms were down there, depending on different times of the year. So it was, uh, we went to a restaurant also that the whole place was almost like a hobbit 
type place and everything underground. And it's, yeah. And so, I mean, it's like the only way you can eat and not die with the heat out there at certain times. So that was another thing that was definitely different. And so their vines are extremely stressed with that kind of intense heat and then cooling in the winter time. So it produces really intense wines. And then I don't know, Sheila, if, or I don't know, so I'm asking Sheila, do you know how badly hit um, that area was with the phylloxera? Uh, historically, or? Yeah. Well, just uh, when the whole phylloxera thing came through Europe. Yeah, I, the big survivor of phylloxera there was Grenache. So I know they lost a lot of Tempranillo, um, and those vines definitely had to be, and those vineyards had to be replanted. Um, the other grapes uh, there in Spain that grow really abundantly in that region are Graciano, which is a little more hardy than Tempranillo. Um, and then you'll also have uh, Carignan, which is very earthy and very hardy and loves sandy soils. And um, that sandy soil is naturally pest resilient. Um, so Tempranillo, of the grapes that grow most abundantly in northern Spain, Tempranillo is the most kind of sensitive uh, of all of those. And it is because of that clustering. The other ones tend to be, um, like with Garnacha, I mean, it's the workhorse of the wine world. It can grow everywhere. It does everything. I mean, it's very versatile. Carignan's already earthy. Um, that Tempranillo, just because it is so tightly clustered and it grows so um, really prone to, don't know the exact history of that, that, that those three are the survivor grapes that little Spanish group there. But yeah, Tempranillo, Tempranillo is temperamental. So that's the, the, how it goes. So we're getting ready to open one of the bottles that we brought from Spain. And then we're going to pour some of our Tempranillo into our glass and then some of the Spanish Tempranillo into our glass. And then uh, talk about the differences yeah, there. Okay, no, it was just regular talk. Um, so I can talk about the flavor um, that we touched on at the beginning of the class. Um, what's cool about Tempranillo is in all of our previous classes, usually we're trying to characterize whether it's red fruit or blue fruit or purple fruit. Tempranillo actually has little hints of all those fruits that you'll find in there, which is what makes it so wonderful and complex. Um, so kind of the purple fruit that we get to out of Tempranillo is plum. So you might be able to smell some of that plummy note on there. Um, cherries, which is your most dominant red fruit, and maybe even a little strawberry tartness to it. Those tend to be kind of the three main characters um, when it comes to the fruit on uh, Tempranillo. And then we have all these wonderful savory characteristics. Uh, Nate talked about leather. Um, a lot of times there's cedar. Um, sometimes you might even get like tobacco leaf. And then a little bit of herbal quality. In some Tempranillos, you may even get um, dill, that kind of like really kind of sweet dill herbace herbaceous note on there. So Tempranillo kind of absorbs a lot of those herbaceous uh, notes to it. But that's the roundabout um, flavor profile for Tempranillo. Um, and then, of course, each one's going to be a little different. And then the winemaker can kind of put their fingerprints on it. So I'm really excited for you guys. Um, to be able to try their Tempranillo because they're going to be able to put their own characteristics on kind of that nice base. And then, yeah, it really plays nice well or plays well with oak very nicely. It'll add some of those kind of vanilla flavors, a little bit of spice box. Um, but that's our overall impression. And then the color of it, you would think that something that's got such thick skins on it um, would be a really dark, but a lot of times in the glass it presents very ruby color. So if you've got a chance in whatever Tempranillo you've got or red one you've got, I always like to hold it up to like a white background and kind of see what the overall color that comes through. Um, with Tempranillo, it's all over the place. Sometimes, like I said, it's that nice ruby color. Sometimes it's got more of a garnet. Um, it really does have so much versatility to it. And I'm really excited to see um, the bottle that Nate and Dre are drinking and, and what color is really coming through on that. And yeah, go ahead and put in the comments. I would love to see, like I said, Tempranillo is very versatile and everybody's glass is gonna be a little different. If you're getting one characteristic over the other, throw it in the group chat and we can see what everybody's 
over, you know, what the most dominant characteristic is because um, they're all going to be a little bit different. But yeah, plums, cherries, strawberries, and then all the wonderful spice and herbal notes. So we ended up opening the 2015 Toro Almarez. Um, and so this is theirs, and then this is ours. So our camera is not the best, so you can't really see as much of a difference, but there's just a little bit darker than ours, but the, the ring around the top is both more of a purple than a red. Nate, you want to talk about what you're doing with tea? Yeah, again, again, on Tempranillo for me, tannins are just huge, absolutely gripping. Uh, Again, with this new wine, we just opened the Spanish wine. Uh, nice spice in the floral, in the bouquet. Um, very rich, deep, long finish um, with the fruit complexity. Um, and then tannins just grip all the way around and they don't let go. So I've had one sip and I'm still just chewing on my own self right now <laughs> so yeah it's I would say Tempranillo is refining and trying to elegance the beast because Tempranillo is just a is a powerhouse and with our 2018 each year we do a little bit of blending before we bottle and we're able to blend in a little bit of other varietals to, you know, for whatever reason, but we typically blend a little bit of other varietals in just to smooth any of the rough edges of the varietal. But we can still call it that varietal as long as we have at least 85% in of the straight varietal in there. And so with our 2018, we did blend a little bit of two other varietals in there. But with our 2019 that we'll be bottling in the spring, we tried pretty much everything, everything. Uh, to it, every possible varietal. And there was nothing that could make it better than it already was. And so our 2019 will be 100% Tempranillo with absolutely nothing backing it. And it is a beast. And we were a little worried that it would be too much for some people, but then we thought, you know, the people that it's too much for can have something else because we have lots to choose from. But uh, we really think that everyone is going to just be blown away by it. It, it really is a beast. That, Every, every part of it, start to finish. So we're excited about it. Um, Jess, what are people saying in the comments about their flavors and stuff? So far, no one said anything in the flavors that they're, people are being shy right now, which is okay. They just need to drink a little bit more Tempranillo and then they'll uh, be feeling good. And it's complex. There's a lot going on in any bottle of Tempranillo that you try. So it may take a little, you know, but yeah, pick a fruit and see if you can get that. And then, yeah, get that note, get your, we talked about looking at the color. We didn't talk a lot about the aromatics um, of Tempranillo, but again, there's just a lot of complexity in there. So I always try to tell everybody like, get your beak all the way in that glass and just get a good whiff of that. And it really will, start to connect some dots for you but with Tempranillo it's it's so diverse and then yeah it's never it's never a one note wine um there's always got a lot of different buttons to push we do have a question about the 2019 when will that be available we'll be bottling that in April and so and then we're gonna hold it for a year and yeah we're gonna have to hold it at least a year in bottle because it's so big Oh, that's true. I was going to say, we were thinking about doing the tasting event like well, we did last year. So if we're able to be open um, in the summer, the way we introduced our 2018 vintage this last year, we did it all socially distanced and everything, but we did allow everyone that uh, RSVP to the event to come and taste our entire 18 vintage. We were th considering doing that with our 2019 vintage as well. Um, we're bottling a whole month later this year, I think. And so we might do that. Well, then it'll be too hot in July. So we still have to work it out. Yeah. Uh, but in the summer, we may go ahead and do another tasting event like that um, because we don't know if we'll still be able to do parties, but we can do a tasting. And so then it would be available at that event if we were able to do that. Um, 
and then, but we would just very highly recommend laying it down for a while. Yeah. And then Bernie and Patty have a great question. How is the Tempranillo that you guys just opened, how is it different from the, our Vinamoto Tempranillo? Uh, I was just breaking it down. So um, <laughs> it um, it's very spicy and more of a uh, almost Christmas spice of the spice rack. Um, in the very beginning in the nose, extremely rich, bold Tempranillo just blast to the face. Um, but then it's a little bit thin and um, finishes with huge tannins, but it dries out like a bucket of sand. So um, very, very, very dry um, in the finish, which I do remember. And then it reminded me of the climate and where we were and just that white sand, rocky, it's in that minerality of that. Um, then I went back and I tried the Vina Moda 2018. And you wouldn't believe the cream, yeah. cream and butter over the top, which when I originally was drinking the Tempranillo to start with the Vina Moda, I didn't get the cream and butter that predominant. But once I have this and the like spiciness of this, then I go to the Vina Moda, I'm like, holy crap, that is creamy butter over the top of like rich decadence. So. You can smell the barrel program on the Vina Moda once we went from the Spanish one. And I, I don't detect as much of the barrel program with the Spanish one, but that's probably because it, it does, a lot of the other flavors and aromas dominate that. Um, but the cream on that, I, I really detect the barrel program um, on the nose, on the Vinamota in a big way. I saw a question. Uh, there is another question. Um, since everyone knows Barbara is our our main grape, but um, what is the biggest difference between a Barbera and a Tempranillo? Well, they're completely different animals. <laughs> acidity, yeah. acidity for one. Barbera is the most acidic grape in the world. So um, acidity, this Tempranillo is not- will you, Nate, will you describe kind of, I think sometimes when people hear acidity, they don't think it's like, they don't understand that it's like, it's not a bad thing. No, um, so you just it. describe like a little bit more about like that's a characteristic that's a totally normal characteristic of a Barbera but we just yeah. talk a little bit more about it yeah acidity um, primarily is coming from there's like seven component acids in in grapes and primarily you're getting like your citric acid and your malic acid and I, you, you can go through all the different acids but but we're what we're focusing on primarily in the flavor profile would be what you would think of as somewhat lemon. Um, so um, it's gonna hit you in the sides of your tongues, in the side of your cheeks. Um, and then what you really don't want is that lemon to go down the throat. That's So in blending trials, we make sure we never have a wine that you'll find lemon down the throat. That's the last place we wanna find um, acid flavors. But um, Barbera primarily is going to be very acidic. We pick ours extremely late. I've over time I've learned that you can't pick Barbera like you do normal grapes because it is the most acidic grape in the world. So you've got to let the acidity drop out while the pH rises, and that only happens with higher sugar levels. So we really in the wine we have to be careful and do a lot of uh, mastermind work in the background um, to make the Barbera turn out right. But um, I would say the difference between that and then Tempranillo also, the tannins. Barbera does have some tannins. Both have really good color. Tempranillo is a little darker, but tannin-wise, Tempranillo is just a beast. I like, I think it was Sheila saying that it's like the cab of Spain, and it really is. I mean, it's, it's monstrous. And then another thing of, on the vineyard side, when I was there, one of the small things a lot of the vineyards were doing was growing... 10, 12 acres of Cabernet Sauvignon. And they're using that to blend back into the Tempranillo as a, as a backbone blend, blender to kind of smooth some of the rough edges. So, um, but yeah, I would say in Barbera in Italy is planted as one of the somewhat dog grapes of Italy. And it's it sucks to say that because, but that's what all the Italians I've talked to says. It's like, oh yeah, they, they put it in the shittiest soil um, on the side of a hill that not like they wouldn't plant their Nebbiolo or like 
their Brunello and stuff, they would, they're putting it over in like the, the redheaded stepchild side of the vineyard and um, they make Barbera that way. So um, here in America, we're, we're giving a lot more love to our Barbera and we grow it in prime areas and pick it when it needs to be done and give it the love it deserves. So long-winded ex explanation. But one of the similarities between the two varietals is how versatile they are with food. Um, Barbera you can have with pretty much any kind of meat. You can have it with heavy dishes. You can have it with barbecue. You can have it with all, you know, anything like that. And I would say that that goes very well similarly with Tempranillo. Um, Tempranillo is great with your heavier meats. It's great with your heavier dishes because it's just really well balanced. It can handle um, so many different flavor profiles. And then we had it with a lot of Iberian ham and it was just really nice, the fattiness of that, of the meat, um, but it's so thin that it's not overwhelming and it just really went well with the Tempranillo. And I would say this, it's very similar with Barbera where the fattiness of, of meat and things like that just really goes well with the acids. And so even though they're, they're kind of different animals, they're both very versatile when it comes to pairing food dishes with them, especially rich dishes. Um, they both offer something slightly different, but the pairing is, is really nice. I agree with that with, sorry, my dog is insisting on participating. Um, and we, it's really fair when you're trying to understand Tempranillo to compare whatever you do know about Cabernet. Um, Cabernet, people love to drink it all the time with food, but it isn't always the best pairing with a lot of foods um, because it doesn't always play nice. It can tend to overwhelm your palate. It can kind of swell your palate with alcohol. The tannins are really strong. What's nice about Tempranillo is there is some balance there. Um, so I like to think of Tempranillo a lot of times, especially the younger ones, as like summertime cabs. So if you don't want something that's so heavy and so complex, there are Tempranillos that are a little bit lighter. And then Tempranillo does really well with like tomato sauces, uh, creamy sauces. So it's kind of like, a t you know, the versatility of Italian wine meets Cabernet, which is just like a food lover's, you know, perfect wine, because that means you don't have to think too much about it. It's going to not fight with your food. It's got herbaceousness to it. And if you've got any herbaceousness in your food, you know, those things are going to go really well. So um, I love Tempranillo as a catch-all um, as far as if you don't know what you're going to have. But yeah, it'll hold up to a rich meal. And then yeah, your summertime red wine drinkers like Tempranillo is fantastic because you still, if you really like that complexity, but you maybe don't want the heat um, of the Cabernet, the Tempranillo tends to be a lot milder and a lot smoother, um, even Very though smooth. it is a big wine, but it, it continues to be, you know, smooth on your palate without, you know, making overwhelming your palate so that you don't get to taste any of your hard earned food that you've been sweating over in, in the kitchen. So grilled meats, lamb, ham, any pork, um, anything that goes grilled. I mean, think about your favorite Spanish foods. Um, even like rich paellas, you know how they throw everything in that paella and they put saffron in there and like it's just got a lot of stuff going on. Tempranillo will hold up to that. It's a, it's a great pairing, those two. So funny you say that. So Mo, who is our cellar master, she um, is making dinner with her family so she is not able to be here today. But she sent a message and said that they had turkey tacos with saffron and it was excellent. And then any spicy foods like Mexican and any smoky meats are good pairings. Mo's our resident chef. And so she is, anytime we have a food pairing question, I feel like Mo is the person to ask because she's so fantastic at it. But it's so funny that you were mentioning that because I'm like, that's exactly what she said. And then um, we had a couple of questions or yeah, so from Patty and Bernie, they say, Nate, I recall that when we visited the different regions that they had different characteristics. My favorite was the Toro region. Could you speak a little bit more on that? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, the very first region we flew into, I can't remember the names of each region we were at. Um, it was overall the region, but then there were different pockets. Yeah, there were different pockets, and they all had grown these grapes for hundreds of years. And I mean, they've been growing grapes forever, and it's their own style, and and each one was their own different clone. 
So that was a cool thing that we did was each one had a different clone. But in the very beginning region was more on the red fruit, a little tartar, um, more acidic. Um, and their soil was schistier. Yeah, and like really sandy, white, uh, just rocky soil. And it had a huge minerality about it. Mm -hmm. And then the next region we went to was bolder, but also a little bit smoother. And I remember liking that more. And then the next region we went to was right around by um, where they specialized more in white wines. And it and was on the river. And so it had more. Like Jurello or Penedes? Does that sound? That's it's hard to say, it's been two and a half years now. Yeah. <laughs> But so, it, we, Spain, we ended up having to drive out further from where we were normally going. It took us a while to get out there. And that was the one where we had, it was this bottle with the, uh, with the hands with the on hands, it. Yeah. Do you remember that, Bernie and Patty? Yeah. And they yeah. specialized more in white wines. And then that was also where they, we went to that Hobbit underground and ate all that little baby pig. It was an amazing, <laughs> amazing trip. But um, yeah, that, that was one of the, the main things was, um, and then we went to that white region and it was really hot climate. And then we went to Toro, which was the last. And honestly, I, I feel like Toro would have been even more amazing had we been even fresher in our trip. Um, but we were all partied out for, I don't know, Two seven, days, eight, yeah. like, 10 days at this point. All of us were half sick already with whatever funk we all were having. And, but it, it blew our freaking mind. And we went to that young winemaker's place and he had just a really small, it was one of the smallest wineries we went to the whole entire trip. And none of us could hardly eat. He put out this huge food spread for us and none of us could barely eat because we were all feeling just so worn out and just half sick. And then right after that is when we went to that like Chateau Castle slash place it was just where we got the best wine we've ever had in our lives and that place that we went to by the way that the castle chateau place it was robert parker if any of you guys know out there in the wine world robert parker is one of the most influential wine writers and and giving scores to people um these guys got two 100 point scores not yeah. one one is astronomical two on this one winery itself. Um, so just just phenomenal wine, hospitality, everything. And so I hope at some point in my life, I'm gonna go back to that region and go directly there and spend a little more time there and uh, let them know the influence they had on me. Oh, Patty has another question. So we do have another question. Um, so we had some notes on the 2018 Tempranillo first, which was, it's really wonderful finish. We love the smooth and elegant and there's that earthy, but it's so well balanced and lasts forever. It wraps around the tongue so nicely. And then, um, oh, and we have a couple people that have to leave us. And so we thank you guys for joining us this evening. Um, so the Mueller's are wondering, so they've been enjoying our cabs so much. How would you compare this Tempranillo with our cabs? Um, our Cabernet um, is a little bit spicier, I would say, and also a little bit of an herbaceous note, which is very um, characteristic to Cabernet um, with the classic, classic proper cap. So. And more specifically red fruit, whereas this is like... And purple. then exactly, and then very much cherry to the front with our cab, um, where this is more of a reserved, you dig past some of the layers of those tannins and depth to get to that. But it still has the, the mouth feel that's very intense. It has chewy tannins. Um, our cabs aren't always chewy tannins, but they're at least firm tannins. There's always some leather there, and there is some herbaceousness, and we usually do have a little bit of a cream layer to our cab, which is similar to, to this. Well, I don't know if it's similar, but it, in addition to that. <laughs> and I know the Mueller's are cab only at this point for their wine club shipments, and uh, 2019 is our last year doing cab for the foreseeable future. And so I think if, if you're looking to replace your cab once we run out, with a different varietal, the Tempranillo would definitely be 
a front runner for that, or the Petite Syrah, but mm -hmm. probably the Tempranillo, the Tempranillo more so. They are similar, for yeah. sure. But Tempranillo also tannins, just tannins galore. Just takes you and takes you. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. Does anyone else want to talk about what they're experiencing with the Tempranillo? We could unmute people and they can share and if they don't want to type. Just unmute yourselves if you want to share. I guess I have to unmute myself. <laughs> I was like, yeah, everyone chip in. It Chuck? is awesome to see all of you. And Nate, I just wonder, um, how are you enjoying your time off from Yellowstone? <laughs> you look you look like a guy from the, the series Yellowstone. Isn't so that funny. So we keep having so, so many people tell us, oh, you gotta watch Yellowstone. And I just let them you see do. It. I almost got the reference. <laughs> I'll I'll mute myself now, but you really need to watch it. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Rather, yeah. No. I do want to say that the this Tempranillo compared to the ones we had in Spain, and I, I, I love your description. This to me seems so much creamier than the ones that I remember tasting. Now we haven't opened the one bottle that we're we're saving. And so I'm kind of curious to see how that compares. But the other ones that we have tried, I would agree they have that uh earthier taste kind of a more more spice this is just creamy and smooth awesome very good thank you mm -hmm. and you know what's you know what's crazy about that is six months ago this wine when we first tried it blew my freaking head off i'm like oh crap what do we do um <laughs> i don't know that people are gonna be able to handle this it, i don't know if they'll be able to buy this but um to see the way it's softened down already just super ex i mean Super excited to see its progress and can't wait to see what's going to be in a couple of years. So, yeah. Oh. yeah. And Patty, it's good to see you too. It's good to see all of you guys. We've been, we've been shut down at our tasting room, so I haven't got to see most of my favorite people. So it's been, been a little tough, it's a little depressing. I've been really missing everybody. So, but we've been we, uh, the blending crowd, so. we came, uh, we got exposed on Christmas Day. Oh. And so we had a um, a test yesterday. So we're we're staying at home. So we're we're totally at home, but we feel fine. No temperature, no cough, no nothing. So Good. hopefully it'll all be okay. I know. We hope so too for you. Jess, was there another question? Um, we did have a question. I had an answer. I don't know. I mean, I'm basing it off of our tasting notes. Um, how long do you recommend we keep it bottled before drinking it? And then I just said, enjoy now or sell her up to 18 years, which is. I would, say, I would say right now it's drinking absolutely beautiful, but I would say in two more years, it's going to be that much better. You don't have so. to wait 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can treat your tempranillos like your Cabernets, because that is what's beautiful about them is they're so ageable. So um, you'll find some of the Tempranillo from Spain. A lot of times they don't release it until it's four or six years old to start out with for their initial release. So um, well, that's but what then you're talking about the labeling, right? So if you get a label yeah. that's like a Reserva, that's already yeah. been aged five years. So you don't want to age that as long yourself. Yeah, your typical, so uh, a lot of South American countries will use the word Reserva and kind of throw it around there and it doesn't have a lot of consistency. That's not true for Rioja. Um, Reserva means three years minimum and at least one year in a barrel. So a Rioja Reserva, you know that's kind of the standard for Rioja that's a three-year-old wine that's when they're releasing it um, you can find Crianzas and Hovens and those are younger but it's they much prefer to age it when they have a good vintage and then anytime you find a Grand Reserva which is at least five years old they only do Grand Reservas on a good vintage year so you don't have to keep track of every vintage in Rioja if you're getting a Grand Reserva 
so a lot of times if you love a wine and you bought that Grand Reserva and it's fantastic and then you go to get it again and you can't find the next vintage, they may not be a next vintage. They may wait until they get a really spectacular year to do that. But in the meantime, you can always drink the Rioja Reservas and the Crianzas, which are the younger versions of those. And what are the price points on that like in your experience? Um, a Grand Reserva is probably, it, it's just going to depend, $35, 30 to $35. A Reserva is usually 20 to 24 um, Crianza, under 20 A Hoven, that's, that's the kind of entry-level Rioja, $10, $12. That's really reasonable. So to speak, yeah. So just the, you know, of course, the longer they have to hold on to it, the more it is. Um, but Spanish wine in general tends to be very economically driven. Um, but the, and they don't, they're just, when you talked about the regions and the Toro, they're just figuring out how to really classify those wines. Like you said, they've been making them for generations, hundreds of years, and they're kind of taking steps from the Italians and the French about really labeling their wine because one of the things they have to deal with and California had to deal with that in the 70s is people bottling stuff up and nobody knows what's in that bottle. So Spain is really starting to like get into the labeling, get into the wine regions. They only have so many winemaking regions, but they're creating more designations all the time. Um, but yeah, Rioja and Ribera del Duero, where you guys were, those are definitely the most prestigious. The next one you would find is like Priorat, which is straight Carignan. It's like what I would call like a dirty Tempranillo. <laughs> Those Priorats tend to be like really, really earthy um, and spicy as well. Um, and then of course, Cava. And those would be your four most prominent. But all those other regions, like I said, they've been making wine for years. They're just now figuring out how to market and make sure that somebody can't copy what they're doing um, and put their, their names of their wines on there. I saw Patty ask, oh, yeah, as long as should they hold on to their alabaster? So I'm looking at the label, it's 2015. Is it 15 years too? Yours is a 2015? That was the yeah. biggest, that was from that table. Mm -hmm. I would say that's uh, open in 2025. God forbid that we all live that long. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is that when we're going to drink it together? Yeah, or at our whenever we have our Spain. Yeah, we're when, opening this when we're all of our Spain this people get we have our Spain thing. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. We have a few other bottles. So yeah, you save yours till 2025, and then we'll drink that together. <laughs> we'll open ours first and drink it. Do we have, we have other questions or anything or? I don't think I missed any. Just I hope everybody has a good uh, New Year. Ooh. And you have some, like a nice meal or a nice bottle of wine planned for tomorrow night. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. That's Happy right. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, Lisa asked, uh, do we have any tasting note books coming from Dre anytime soon? Um, not yet. Um, I would really love to do something. I want artwork to go with it. And so um, for a while I was working with, there is a 16 year old daughter of our members, it's a photographer. And so she was so inspired by the notes. Obviously she wasn't drinking the wine, but she was inspired by the notes that she wanted to create a photograph to go with my notes and we were gonna do a book together. But it turned out to be just a really, it was just a little too much for her to try to undertake. So I think maybe something more of like a mixed media thing with, with paintings and photographs to try to recreate each of the notes with a photograph seems like a daunting task. And so uh, maybe if we could do something with mixed media, I would really enjoy doing that. Um, my dad and mom actually recently um, created something for some friends of our, theirs. Um, they had lost their home in uh, one of the fires. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting which fire. Um, but my dad had gotten them a bottle of Phoenix and then given them the notes from the 2014 Phoenix. And they loved them so much that 
as a gift to them. Um, their friends all created this beautiful, it wasn't even our graphics because I didn't write down that I was supposed to send my dad the graphic. And so a friend of theirs created this beautiful graphic of a phoenix with the 2014 notes and they're having it matted and framed with signatures of like e-signatures since they can't all see each other um, to give to them as a gift. And so if I could do something like that um, with it to where it wasn't just the words and there was some mixed media in there where it was was art along with my words to to go with it, then I would absolutely do that. But I need to maybe work with some artists to, to do that. But thank you for asking. And then Bernie and Patty are wondering, are we ever going to go to Sicily? If they'll allow us at some point. <laughs> yes. yes, that's where I want to go though. Yes, back to Sicily again. Uh, well, we didn't go, okay. but that, I want the same plan to happen because that trip was amazing. I, I'm so looking forward to it. We're in. Yes. Well, and we were supposed to take uh, my parents also. They were going to meet us after Sicily or Sicily, we were going to go to um, the Amalfi well, Coast, right? To what? Yeah, no, not the Amalfi Coast. That was the well, program. But we were supposed to go to uh, Tropea on the coast and then to Rome for a while. And we, our daughter, Ali, is graduating from high school in the summer. And so we were going to take her last summer as our last kind of thing uh, with her at home. And then it was over Sheila's birthday, so we were going to see if she could meet us in Rome. Um, and none of that happened in 2020, but you know, we, what can we do about the uh, events we're, of the club? We're in. Okay. Look forward. I'd say 2022. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Let's plan ahead. Let's plan on it. Yep. Gonna go to Spain or not Spain? Ah, we are going to Spain. We're going to go Sicily. to Sicily. Be awesome. Well, and then Jess and her mom are hoping to explore Sicily as well. I'm Sicilian, so very important distinction between Italian, my grandma would say. So I've only been to Sicily once and I was five, so it doesn't count. So going and drinking wine with some of my favorite people sounds like a lot better than being five in Sicily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have enough confident people that now we can you now. Know, be able to sneak away with us. Do we have any other questions or anyone want to talk about the Tempranillo? Since it is our first release of Tempranillo, we'd love to hear your feedback. Do and then, to tell you, Nate, this is, I think of the wines, my favorite is the Syrah. This is a close competition. Thank you. That's huge from Bernie. He's such a Syrah man. <laughs> and you know what, you know, so also on top of that too, um, what a monster this wine is when we go into blending trials we're usually looking on and like pulling on our Grenache our Syrah Petit Syrah being so big it's a great blend. Um, but we're, we're usually pulling from these wines that are so wine friendly they go in anything but Tempranillo this year which I would not expect Tempranillo to go and like help soften something or I mean I would expect it to overwhelm things Tempranillo came in and went into several of our wines this year um, and really helped and say, I mean, made Took wines it to the that next were very level. good. Yeah, it's next yeah, level. Next stuff. level. And I, I, it's just amazing how it's worked so well in our program. So, yeah, I'm really excited about it. And then it was funny for the Naragis, my other clients that I make wine for, um, you guys will be hopefully getting to experience some of their wines soon. Absolutely next level, game changing. Um, but Sagrantino. So, any of you guys, Villa Valacito people out there? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, have you tried the Sagrantino? Not yet. Okay. She never pours it on her list, but it's like occasionally she'll bring it out. If you go to one of her parties, she'll bring out a bottle. But it's her hundred dollar a bottle Sagrantino. It's super rare varietal from Italy. But Isn't it's a like staff, eighteen it's, acres grown in the United States. Yeah, in the whole United States, and G has like ten or four of those acres. Uh, You're making her wine? Yeah, he's always oh, been yeah. making I've her. always made Villa Valle. I know, with that special Severantino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I make all that for her. Um, but we make a small production every year. But it is the, Sagrantino is the most tannic grape in the world. So even more than Tempranillo, more than anything, it's the most tannic grape in the world. 
So it's funny, Villa Valacito is like, she's such an extremist. She does Barbera, the most acidic grape in the world, and then Sagrantino, the most tannic grape in the world. So uh, working with that, I, I, I would never think Sagrantino to be a good play with others and like blend in. But this year for Naragi's, they got Sagrantino and it played into most of their blends. So I was really surprised to see that. Awesome. And one other thing I want to say is it would be such fun for all of these people to be actually together. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Someday. Yes. We'll have to do a Zoom evening for all the regulars from our Zoom classes because we really appreciate you guys coming and hanging out with us while we talk about our favorite things. So, you know, and one of the things we used to be so well known for was uh, we'd throw our badass parties. We only threw three a year, but they were just epic, badass parties. And I miss that. I, I know, yeah, I know. Costumes mm -hmm. and dancing and debauchery and you know, late night madness. But I miss that. And I mean, that was one of the things we were known for. So, can't wait to get back there and get to have our first big party with everybody again. Yeah. I'm gonna have to say, Chuck, you have been uh, oddly silent. Yes, for me, that's that's unusual. Do you have any questions or comments? Well, I, uh, like a, a short commentary sort of thing. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a huge Barbera fan, and um, and uh, over time, uh, drinking Vina Moda wine, I've actually. Um, turned into a Syrah fan, which I never thought was going to happen because I was, I would, that, that was the one wine that I would turn down. Um, but I've been drinking uh, the last couple of wine, wines I've had were the 2016 uh, uh, Syrah and the 2016 uh, Phoenix. And then I opened this uh, Tempranillo tonight and it bit my head off. It just, it shocked me. I, 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 I'm used to taking the first sip and just going, ah, oh, yes, this is just, it's just the most wonderful thing. This scared me. <laughs> it's, um, and it's, it's the tannins, of course. I'm not, you know, I, I haven't had a bottle of Cabernet for years, uh, which is probably the closest thing to this, um, I guess. Um, but, um, it took me um, into my second glass because I, I, I never give up, right? Um, to actually start tasting further in, getting some of the depth out of this. Um, I would really like to taste this in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, Nate, you were saying a little while ago that you, um, you opened this up six months ago. Um, I can't imagine. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, it, it did. Like yeah, you said, it, it ripped my it. face like halfway off. I was yeah. just like, what the hell just happened? So yeah, but um, I mean, it's it's wonderful. You know, I do, you know, I I I never I never have any doubt that um, that what Vina Moda produces is going to be outstanding. Um, so, like I said, it, it it just takes me a little while to understand the the depth and get the full experience out of out of something like you know that's new like i said this was this was more shocking to me it, it surprised me um, um mostly because i'm not i'm not drinking a lot of high tanning wines so good night to my mom and dad no I, I was i'm trying to type and i'm not doing a good job um, my mom and dad happy new I, year yeah happy new year I would say if you still have half that bottle, um, go ahead and put the cap back on it and have it tomorrow. And yeah, yeah. So I was, ours, ours, ours is gone. <laughs> I was, I was letting yeah. it breathe overnight because it is such a big wine. That's like aging it. Uh, okay. a, while, a couple you know? of years. Left. We're we're thinking that it's going to prevent the COVID from hitting us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead and, check that and have it tomorrow, that. and I'd love to hear your experience of it on second day. Because the lighter oh. wines, you don't want to leave them to that oxygen overnight. Mm -hmm. But the bigger, younger wines, when you're able to do that, if we're going to have a young wine that's super tannic and super tight, we'll have each half a glass 
and then we'll put the cap back on and then we save it for the next day and then we have it and it's like a whole different experience yeah. and just probably even from the start of the class to now like you said your second glass is so much more approachable yeah. and then tomorrow it's going to be even more so if you only have a little bit in the glass or in the bottle then it might be a little bit more oxygen exposed but if you've got yeah. a bottle left yeah, I've only tomorrow. I've only had two glasses, so okay. I'll, I'll I'll wait in, until tomorrow on it. But um, you yes, know, it does sound like a lot of self control. But we don't just have half a glass of that and don't have anything else. We have a half a glass of that and then have a bottle of. Something. Oh, trust me, this will not be the only <laughs> bottle I open tonight. <laughs> yes, Lisa. And, then, and then also, Chuck, I the 2018 Syrah, and for Bernie too, because I know what a fan he is. Right. Um, 2018 Syrah. Oh my God, it's it's next level. Um, it and our 17 won the double gold best of class. I mean, it was the highest. And so the 18 though turns my head. It's oh yeah, insane. it was outstanding. I you know I, I um between you know Jess and and Dre, you probably get tired of of me posting on on Facebook or or yes. sending you messages because I get so excited when I open a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm you know, I'm about, you know, I'm into, you know, about halfway through my first class, and I'm going, oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread, and I just have to tell somebody, especially right now, you know, with uh, with the, uh, you know, the the pandemic and everything, I don't have anyone to, that I'm sharing this with, so you're it. <laughs> well, you want to share it with someone who knows what you're talking about. Right. We right. will never complain about you sharing your no. love for being a model. <laughs> that goes, we, I, you know, because we love, we love our wine and hearing you in those moments where you're loving it too, it's like, oh, it's this, I mean, what's the point if people aren't enjoying it? So uh, it's I'm, the highlight I'm, of my day a lot of times. Like I got a text last night, someone was, had opened a 2011 Venus and was just like, ooh, it, and I just was so jealous. I can't remember the last time I had a 2011 Venus. And then we had some members that aren't here tonight that uh, took a bottle of 2010 Barbera to Las Vegas a few months ago um, to have right before they got married. Yeah. And it was like, that's, such a compliment. Yeah, such a compliment that that is the wine that they took for them to have on their wedding night. Well, awesome. You know, I still I still have several several bottles of the um, 2009 and and some of the 2008 Barberas left. What I've found though, and and Nate, I know that you you got to taste this, Andre. You got to taste it when it was fresh. Oh, that was open. the Morved. Oh, the Morved. Oh, yeah. that's right. That's right. The Morveds. And um, I've I found that um, that if I open a bottle now, I have to drink it like immediately. It, yeah. I, I practically have to chug it because otherwise it goes bad like so fast. Um, it's, and it, it's sad. Well, and it's, it's, it's so amazing though. <laughs> it is. And also check those, those uh, like lighter varietals that we do, especially like the uh, Morbed and uh, Pinot Noir, Grenache, stuff like that. Now we're doing Sangiovese. Um, but we, uh, I do very low sulfites in those. Since I get a, do the screw cap, I get away with running a quarter of the amount of sulfites that I do with any bottle um, with a cork wine. Mm. So uh, if I do it with the cork, I've really got to jack my SO2s up um, because it's breathing so rapidly. But I use on my screw caps, we're using a quarter breathable so I can get away with running a quarter of the rate of what I do. I actually run a little higher, I run probably about 30%, um, 29, 30% um, instead of all the way to 100%. Um, but it's when we're aging our wines, when we open them, they do have to be drank sooner because Those I don't have all ones. the sulfites in there. So, um, right. which honestly, it's just so much better to the less sulfites, the less headaches, the less all the crap that comes with it. So. Oh, it tastes, absolutely. The taste of the wine, honestly, I can taste on those lighter wines, I can taste the sulfites. I'm so wow. sensitive to them and they affect my nose. I can even smell them a lot of times. And so, yeah, with those Mavets, especially because they've been aging all this time, they're beautiful. But right now, obviously, if you can't have a friend over, you're committing to that bottle that Yeah, night. you're partying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. But you know what? It, it, it's worth it because it's so beautiful that, you know, 
um, and 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 I and like you said, um, no headache. Mm -hmm. You know, the next day I I you know I recover really really well, especially considering the fact how old I am. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're beautiful. You just, I just have to drink the entire bottle. When yes, I open no, the 17 Mavet, honestly, the 17 Mavet, if we have it second day, it's fine. Most people wouldn't detect the difference, but we do. So oh. if we open the Mavet or the Grenache or the Pinot, we know that we're drinking it that night. And that's the problem with it, the, uh, the Grenache being Jess's favorite, is that she's either committing to a bottle on her own or she has to have a friend <laughs> over her because we can tell the difference the second day. Yeah. Chuck, yeah. it's good to know we're not alone drinking a bottle at night. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but, but Chuck, there's two of us. <laughs> and how many bottles have you had tonight? <laughs> <laughs> two bottles. <laughs> we're on our second. <laughs> we we did second. have, we kind of touched a little bit on the screw tops, but um, we have a question of the, why do you use screw tops on bottles that need to age like Tempranillo? Dre, did everyone freeze? <laughs> Am I the only one frozen? There you go. Okay, Sheila. So sulfites are nat sulfites are naturally occurring in wine. 